Thanks for being here and making it all the way from Sunday. I know it's a long haul. Um, so I want you to know that you're appreciated. Before I get into introducing Lori Wills, our keynote speaker, I'm going to tell you a couple things that Lori forgot about. Because remembering things Lori forgot is the main part of my job. So, if you lost this sweater, it's got polka dots. It's up here. That's number one. Number two is if you lost this sort of camouflage looking wallet with the Bass Pro Shop uh, logo on the front of it, that's up here too. Um, when you guys came in the room, uh, you all got a couple of pieces of paper. One is a pink card and one is a report card. I'll just talk about each one very briefly. The pink card, of course, as you know, the point of that is, hey, what else thing, George? Wow. There you go. Congratulations. See, there's already a winner. <laughs> um, the pink card. What can we do with those? We collect our questions and comments. We distribute them to various state agencies, including the governor's office. They'll send answers directly to you. And we also take all the answers, collate them, and use them to create our questions and answers book, which is published each fall. It's a great resource for our families here in Florida. So if you ask a question, make a comment, you're not just helping yourself, you're helping other people too. The other thing is our report card. Of course, that's a report card on which you grade us here at the Family Cafe. It allows us to know what you think about this event, how it went, what needs to be added, what needs to be subtracted, what could be better, all that kind of stuff. So please take advantage of both of those. And uh, if you don't get a chance to do it here on site, I also want to let you know that our smartphone app also is another means whereby you can fill out both the pink card and the report card. If you go in the app, there's a survey button there. You click on that survey button, both the pink card and the report card are in there. Okay, so that's the housekeeping business. Now let's move on to talk a little bit about Dorian Wills. Um, I think that Given what happened here in Orlando last night, it's kind of appropriate that Dorian is here with us this morning. Because Dorian is somebody who knows firsthand what it's like to experience the trauma of gun violence. He's also somebody who knows what it means to be an example of resilience and recovery for other people in the community. Um, he's not only a person with a disability, he's also a parent of a child with a disability. And he's a bodybuilder and a paralympic athlete. He competes with a sport, a sport of a skeleton. You guys know what a skeleton is? It's kind of like luge, but you go face first. So this is a guy that goes face first, uh, an inch above a sheet of ice, down in very steep hill with many curves. Kind of scary, but kind of impressive if you think about it. Um, from life of gangs and drugs, he's undergone a radical transformation to become a world class athlete. And like I said, a model of resiliency and determination. So he's going to come up here and he's going to take us through his journey. Um, 21 bullet points, and they're literal bullet points, as he'll explain to you. Uh, we're really happy to have him here with us this morning. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome him to the stage. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dorian. Thank you. Give him a hand. Orlando, how are we doing? Why? 
When you're different, people look at you. How many people in this room have people stare at you on a daily basis? A lot of you, right? When you're different, people stare at you. When people, when, when you're different, people take notice of you. And I found out in my life that is not a bad thing. When you're different and people take notice, people are paying attention. And when people are paying attention, that gives you the power to make change. Because people are paying attention to what you're doing. Embrace that. Embrace your uniqueness. Embrace the fact that you're different. And when people are watching you, take that and do something with it. So I want to tell you about my life. I'm going to tell you uh, about my story. We're going to start from the beginning, where you start every story. So, if we could get the... I was born in Denver, Colorado. Make sure this is working. It's all right. I was born in Denver, Colorado. I had two brothers and a sister. I grew up in a great family. We were very close. We did everything together growing up. As you can see, I was the best looking one out of the group here. Uh, great family. My parents are still married today after 30-something you know, years of marriage. Uh, had, had a, a great upbringing in Denver. I would like to uh, also say that when I'm talking about disabilities today, a lot of times I'll be referring to the haircuts that I had as a child. <laughs> so, growing up in Denver, uh, like I said, I had a great, great upbringing. The, the schools that uh, my brother and sister went to, were, were in the better part of town, the junior high school that they went to. When I was moving up from elementary school to junior high school, they closed down the junior high school that my, my brother and sister attended because of asbestos. And so they ended up shipping the kids from my elementary school to different parts of town. I got the short end of the stick, and they shipped me to a, a school called O'Connell Junior High School, which is, was in a really rough part of town. It was over in Lakewood and on the west side of Denver, uh, predominantly Hispanic. I remember the first day uh, of junior high school as I walked in, there was a metal detector, there was an armed a police officer as you, as you walk in. And the first thing that I heard as I walked through the door was, what are you doing here, white boy? What are you doing here, cracker? You're in the wrong hood. I was scared. I was a scared kid. And every day, for months at this school it was a fight for me. I'd come home black and blue almost on a daily basis. After the first couple months, I stopped waiting for the fights to come to me and I could start seeing them coming. I was just going down. I got really good at fighting at a very young age. And then I started picking the fights because I figured if I take this guy out before they come for me, I'm going to make my point. Quit messing with me. I got the attention of a, of a gang that, that was running the school. It's called Northside Mafia. So they recruited me into their gang. I was the only white kid in their gang. There was only five white kids at, at, at my school when I was one. So they recruited me into the gang. At the age of 12, I started smoking weed. I'm running around with the gang, doing drugs, not making the best decisions of my life. At the age of 12, I'm one of I smoke to leave when I'm packing a gun. I'm packing a gun to school at the age of 12. Before I go to school. Excuse me. Can you still hear me? All right. At the age of 12, I was packing a gun. When I would go to get to school, I would stash it in a bush. And as I came out, I'd, I'd grab it, put it in my waistband. Because now, if somebody's messing with me on the way home, I'd pull it out. And what's scary thinking back, is at the age of 12, I had no problem pulling the trigger. When I, when I read about uh, what had happened here uh, last night in Orlando, it makes me sick to my stomach every time I hear about somebody getting shot. I've been on both ends. I've been the one pulling the trigger. And we'll get to later in my story when I myself took some wounds. <coughs> So things are not going exactly as my parents had hoped for me, 
at this school. They see how quickly I'm going downhill, and they decided to do something uh, for their family. They didn't want to lose their son, and that's the direction that I was heading in. So after my seventh grade year, which I failed, I, I got straight ass. I was doing nothing good with my life at this point. My parents decided to up and move us to Boise, Idaho. This is in 1990, so we, we up and moved to Boise, Idaho. And I remember when we got there, I'm thinking, what are my parents done to me? They moved me out into this redneck country. There's like cows as we're driving by on our way to the house. I'm like, what did my parents do to me? You know, it was a big city that was out. And, and we moved to Boise, Idaho. You know, Boise at the time, there was only about 125,000 people in Boise and the surrounding city, so it was not very big. I remember my first day of junior high school, walking in to, the, to a junior high school. Well, actually, before I left that morning, my mom asked me, are you sure that you want to wear that? So the style back then, where I came from, was hammer pants. Does anybody remember hammer pants? Penny loafers. Once again, not the best decision making. Hammer pants, penny loafers, and a mullet. So. So yes, that's me in the background with polka dotted camera pants. <laughs> so I remember my mom asked me, are you sure you want to wear that? They might have a different style here, but you know, me and my big ego, I don't care what they're wearing. I can wear what I want. I look good in this. So I go to school that day, and uh, of course, I look completely different than all the other kids. But it was a culture shock, because I remember walking into the doors, and, and there was a sea of white kids. And there was football players, and there was cheerleaders, and everybody was smiling. There was a metal detector since I came through the door. And for the first time in a long time, I just remember feeling relief. I could be a kid. I didn't have to worry about, am I going to make it home today? I didn't have to worry about who's going to pick a fight when today at school. And, and it was a great thing that slowly started changing my life. So, Seventh grade goes really well for me. I, I did a, a couple dances, and uh, before I knew it, I was making friends left and right. It wasn't hard for me to make friends. I was doing dances. I, I, I met with some other friends, and we were doing dances at all the, the big festivals that they were having in town. And I was having a, a great time just being a kid. But some of those bad decisions, uh, that I, all those bad decisions that I was making in Denver, you know, some of that followed me to, to Boise. It didn't take me long before I was hanging out with, with a rubber crowd because, you know, they smoked weed and they did these things that I thought was cool, that I didn't see anything wrong with at the time. Throughout my life, that was my biggest problem, was the decisions I was making. We make decisions every single day. Some of them little, some of them don't matter that much. Others matter a lot. Every single day, we decide how our day is going to go. When we, when we wake up in the morning, we decide what kind of person I'm going to be today. Sometimes we just don't have the right guidance and people showing us there's a better way. You can make better decisions. So for years, I just continued making poor choice after poor choice. I did, however, uh, play soccer. I was very good at soccer and uh, played varsity soccer all throughout high school. When I got to my senior year in high school, I had several scholarships to go play for, for colleges. I had a couple scholarships uh, to go play uh, down in Utah. I had a couple scholarships to play in Southern California. But I decided that I didn't want to jump right out of high school into, into college. School was never my thing. I just wanted to hang out and play, with, and, and, play and hang out with my friends that summer. So that's what I did. I got right out of high school, I got an apartment, and it was just a party, a non-stop party, that entire summer. Once again, I was doing nothing to nothing with my life. I was making poor decisions. Uh, instead of going to college and taking advantage of the scholarship that I had, and maybe doing something with my life, I decided to hang out and party with my friends was more important. Decisions. Bad decisions. So, I started getting into harder drugs at this point in time. I'm doing mushrooms, acid, I'm doing these drugs, hanging out with my friends, doing nothing with my life. 
going further and further down. My sister was going to BYU at the time in Utah, and she called me up and said, you know, why don't you come up to Utah, get out of Boise for a little while. I wasn't doing anything, so I said, figure why not? Let's change. So I go up to Utah. I moved up to Utah a few months later, and, and it's amazing looking back now, you know, the crowd that I was hanging around with, you are who you surround yourself with. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. These, these knuckleheads that I was running around with in Boise, they had no drive, they had no goals, they had no ambition. All they wanted to do was chase girls and party. When I moved up to Utah, you know, my, my, my family was, uh, I grew up LDS, uh, Mormon, so my, my sister's going to BYU. And, and I took myself out of this crowd, and when I put myself in this other crowd, the people that my sister were hanging out with, around with, it was weird to me because they're having a good time without getting wasted. They're enjoying life for what it is. They're going camping. You know, they're, they're playing sports. They're, they're doing all these things so good. And so when I took myself out of this crowd, I was doing nothing. And, and I was hanging out. And then I remember two talking, hanging out with my sister. And I'm um, surrounded by people who are going to talk to or uh, have goals, who are making good decisions. It's amazing how easy it is for me to start making good decisions and how easy it was for me to start going in the right direction. Unfortunately, just like when I moved from Denver to Boise, some of those decisions that I made followed me. Same thing happened when I moved from Boise to Utah. I was in Utah for about seven months when I got a call from uh, a girl that I had uh, hooked up with one time at a party in Boise, and she told me that I was having, that she was pregnant and I was having a son at the age of 19. Once again, these decisions that I was making kept getting progressively more serious. And, and at the age of 20, I had my first son, his name is Austin Michaels. Healthy baby boy. So I decided to move back from, from Utah to get to know this girl and to be the father to my son and, and try to raise his son the best that I could. I was a kid myself, still at the time. But I moved back. And I started my own company at the age of 21. Boise was really booming at the time, so I started making a lot of money. I, I, I started a construction company. I went, within a couple of years, I was making almost six figures. I had zero money management skills at that, that particular point in my life. I'm making all this money hand over, hand over this, and I think this is only going to come like that. You know, I'm buying every toy you can imagine for cars, four wheels, motorcycles. I got a big four bedroom house. I had, I had everything at a very young age. I wasn't saving any of my money. As soon as I was getting it, as fast as I was getting it, it was going out. A few years uh, after that, I had, this is my, still my first son right here. A few years um, after I moved back to, uh, moved back to Boise, I had my second son with my wife at the time. My second son, his name is Dorian Kane, he was named after me. He was born with Down syndrome. I remember when he was born, we were actually in Denver at the time when he was born. It was the first time in Denver's history that the entire city was shut down because of a, because of a snowstorm. We got six feet in like a day and a half. We were snowed into the hospital. And we didn't know all the tests before he was born came back he was a healthy baby boy. So we were expecting a healthy baby boy. He was born with two holes in his heart, in his heart. And his oxygen was so low that, that he had to be on oxygen for the first year of his life. I remember being stuck in the hospital, and as soon as he was born, as soon as he was born, the nurse came up to me and she said, not congratulations. Not, it's a baby boy. But it looks like your son has Down syndrome. I didn't know what to think about that. I knew nothing about Down syndrome. I knew nothing about what it was, what it meant for him. All I know is that he was going to be different. I was still young myself, and all I could think about was why me? Why me? Why am I born? Why, why do I have a son that was born different? 
It, was, it wasn't about, it was, what's this going to do in my life? And I remember, for months and months after he was born, there's no joy in that face right there. I just remember being angry at this little kid. These are pictures that also that I haven't ever shared in a presentation. I changed this presentation up quite a bit over the last few days just because I felt after meeting some of you, I need to get up here and speak from the heart. I thought that was the most important thing for me to do with this, uh, at this convention is get up here and just speak from my heart. And so I get a little bit emotional. Bear with me. And if anybody has a problem, me, I'm crying. Please don't talk to me. <laughs> so, for months I'm just angry at this kid. When I come in, he's on the couch, I don't want to touch him. As I leave in the morning, I don't say bye to him. It was probably four or five months after he was born. I came in from work, and I remember walking by and he was laying on the couch. He has an oxygen tube on his nose. And as I'm walking by, I look at him and I stop. And that little kid looked up to me and smiled. Aww. Aww. Stole your heart. <laughs> it was over. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I can tell you that one smile melted all the ice, melted all the hate. And then it, it hit me. He's no different. He needs love just like every single everybody does. He's no different. He just wants to be loved. He just wants his dad to love him. And that kid, every time I saw him after that, had a smile on his face. Smiling. Even with tubes on his face, he had to have that, that oxygen mask on his face for the first year. And these little tabs to keep the oxygen mask on, you have to pull those things off his face every day. The kid barely cried. He took it and, and you know, it would just literally do a beat inside his face. Rod. And a little face is only so many spots you can put those little pads. But he never cried. This kid was amazing. He just never cried. All he did from that point on was make everybody else have a mess of money. Aww. Everybody. He's the most incredible little boy that I've ever met. And he's not the lucky one. I have to have him in my life. Back 
backwards uh, progression. I was partying on the weekend again with my friends. I was barely around on the weekend, but then when Monday hit, you know, I was I was all star dad. I was PTA, you know, PTA. I was my oldest son soccer coach, and, and I took uh, my little guy to work with me Monday through Friday. So when it came to the weekend, I would just kind of disappear. I started using drugs again, and within a year, those drugs started taking over my life. What was really mind blowing uh, was meth. That, that was what really was, was finally my own I remember the first time that I tried that, uh, I, I immediately loved it. I was like, this, this stuff was amazing. And from that point on, nothing mattered to me. Not my kids, not my business, nothing mattered to me. Within six months, I had actually lost my company. My company went under. Within the first year, I hadn't seen my kids for, for eight months. I had moved out of my house. Drugs took control of my life. I drained my bank account. Everything that I had worked so hard for, I started selling to support my habit. My motorcycles, the jet skis, the cars, none of it mattered to me. I remember the last time that I saw my kids in a two year period. I went over to get the, a few last belongings out of the house. And I remember my little guy came, wrapped around my leg, tears just running down his face. My oldest son sitting on the couch crying, but he's mad at me, so he's not going to talk to me. I peel my youngest son off, cave, and I set him on the couch as I grab my last box and I head out the door. I turn around, and Cade is just sitting in the window, bald. Just crying. Daddy. I couldn't mentally take what I was doing to my kids. And so that was the last time that I saw them for, for about uh, 16 months. That was the last time. I started going further downhill, rapidly. After I sold everything that I, I had worked so hard for, my jet skis, my boats, I had emptied my, my bank account. I started stealing. I didn't care who I stole from. I was stealing from my parents. I was stealing from my friends. It didn't matter. It got to the point where even my own mother didn't want me in her house. Same situation, I went over to my mom's house and I had been stealing from them every time I went over. So I went over late one night, my mom's house, the doors had never been locked, never. I go over to my mom's house and I go to open the front door, the front door's locked. So well, that's strange. So I go around to the back door, the back door's locked. I'm coming back around to the front and I see my mom looking through the window. Tears pouring down her face. She shuts the door. My mother didn't want me around because of the person I would become. Instead of taking that as a sign as, hey dummy, look what you're doing to your family. I was just angry. It wasn't my fault that the economy was, you know, the economy was going under and that my business went under. It wasn't my fault that my ex-wife uh, wouldn't let me see my kids. Everything was everybody else's fault. There was no accountability for my decisions. Once again, we all have to make the decision on who we're going to be. We all have to wake up in the morning and decide what kind of person we're going to be. Are you going to wake up and is it going to be about you? Or are you going to wake up and are you going to give whatever you can to other people around you? I can tell you from experience that when you give, you'll give back to other people. Every time. When uh, I hit this point, like I said, I, I, I was taking all the time early, I was just angry at the world. Just angry at the world. It was everybody else's fault. I started going further down. If you can imagine me going any further down, you know. I started doing collections for drug dealers. And when I say collections, they called me the collector. That was my nickname for a while. If you owed somebody money, I was the guy that came to God. I didn't care how I got the money. I didn't care what I had to do. You were going to pay. I'm kicking in doors. I'm doing things that today make my stomach turn. That I have to live with the rest of my life. I can't take back the things that I did. I have to live with that. And in a small way, me speaking to 100,000 kids in the last three, four years, being a 
here today just as a small way that I get to give back to the things that I do. I'm packing around with sawed off sharpening everywhere that I go with me. We won't get into reasons why. I'm driving around in a car that I had taken from somebody that owed me $300. The car wasn't registered. There was no insurance on the car. I get pulled over because there's no registration. It wasn't registered to me. There's no insurance. I gave the police the, the right to search the vehicle. When they searched the vehicle, they found a saw off shotgun underneath the front seat. Now, I don't know what the laws are here, but in Idaho, if you saw the barrel off of a shotgun or a rifle, and that, and that gun is under 21 inches long, that's a federal offense. The gun that they found on me was 20 and one half inches long. A half inch, and I was a big fellow. A half inch, and I am a fellow. 20 and a half inches long, they find a saw off shotgun. I'm arrested. My charge is modified fire. This is a federal offense. I'm sitting in a, in a jail cell with a federal charge is different. You don't get a bailout, you don't have to get a bond. With a federal offense, you either sit in the jail cell until you're sentencing, or the judge releases you on your own cognizance. I remember sitting in the courtroom, and the judge is reading over my charges, the time that I'm facing, and I hear the door open up behind me, and my mom and my dad walk in. He's reading over the charges, and he says, Mr. Willis, is there anybody that we can release you into, into their care until your sentencing date? My mom stands up, and she says, Your Honor, will you please release him into our care? He has two children that he hasn't seen in over a year that he needs to spend some time with before he goes to prison. Bless my mom's heart. She thought she was doing the right thing for me. She wanted to help me. That's what any parent wants to do. They just want, they want to help the kid. And that's what my mom was doing. But my mom made the wrong decision. She should have let me sit in the jail cell. She should have let me rock. She should have let me think about the things that I was doing. But because she's a mother, she wanted to help her. The judge releases me into my mother's care. They put an ankle monitor on me. I'm peeing in the cup several times a day to make sure that I'm staying, uh, or several times a week to make sure that I'm staying sober. And this cleans me up for about two or three months while I'm waiting to be sentenced. I'm facing up to five years in, in a federal penitentiary. And this whole time, because I'm a drug addict, all I can think about is, is I need to use. I'm going to prison anyway, so what else can they take from me? So I decide after two or three months of being in the cup and having an answer to my probation officer that I had enough. I cut off my ankle monitor and I go right back to what I was doing. I plan on doing as many collections, selling as much drugs as I can over the next uh, little while so I can get out of time, out of town, so I can make one to Mexico. I'm kicking in just random doors now. I don't care who you are. Once again, I'm doing things that I have to live with the rest of my life. I'm hiding out at my drug dealer's house, and the cops show up one morning. I came out of the apartment that morning, and I was jumping in my suburban uh, to go get a pack of cigarettes, and, and I see six, seven cop cars coming up the hill. As they're coming up the hill, six, seven cops coming back and back. They're not just doing the patrol, stopping by to say hi, right? So I throw my suburban in reverse. I'm flying in reverse to the parking lot. They see me flying through reverse in the parking lot. I run back up into the apartment. They weren't there for me that day. They were just there because of all the traffic coming in that apartment. I could have drove right by and been on my way. But because I'm paranoid, I'm hot, I throw up reverse. They see me peeling out in reverse and run back into this apartment. I run back up. I flush everything that's in my pockets. I'm telling my, my dealers who I'm, who I'm hiding out of this house. The cops are coming down to get rid of everything. I'm only in that apartment for about 30 seconds. I try to make them run out the back, but it's too late. They always start surrounding the place. I remember thinking, I'm not going to jail today. They are not back to me. So I get this bright idea. I go into the bedroom, and I get in the closet, and I punch a hole in the ceiling. I go up into the ceiling, and I go all the way across the apartment complex to the far side, and I kick a hole and drop through the, uh, into another apartment. Can you imagine sitting around in a bedroom? Hey girl, what's up? And boom, a 225 pound wall, white ball duo talent comes dropping through your ceiling. There was something out of the movie, it was insane. So my whole game plan was I'm gonna break into this other apartment. They're looking for me down here. The hole that I punched in the ceiling to get up in the ceiling, I, put, I pulled the box in front of it so when they opened the closet, they couldn't see it. 
So I'm looking, so I'm, I'm, my whole game plan goes down in this apartment. I'm going to change my clothes real quick, open up the closet, maybe put a hat on. And because they're looking for me all the way down here, I'm going to change my clothes and just walk right out the front door. My whole game plan. The problem was when I opened up the closet, there was nothing but dresses, high heels, pumps, <laughs> there was no chain armor. And, and so I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'm going to look good in dress. I don't think I'm fooling anybody. Hello, officer. <laughs> So, long story short, it, was, it ended up being a three hour standoff. Bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Losing sight of what's really important in my family. All these things, all these decisions came to a head that day. I went through two ceilings, two walls, a floor, and ended up in the basement of this apartment complex. That's where the, the police dogs found me underneath the board, underneath the board and all. They tell me to come out, it's dark, it's chaos, all I can hear is the dogs barking and the cops yelling. I push the board over and I stand up and all I can see is the lights from the rifles. They're yelling, get down, get down. I made a gesture, I won't make it again here, and refused to get on the ground. When my hand comes up, they think I'm pulling a weapon. And they unloaded. I was shot 21 times that day. I took six to the left arm, seven to the chest, six to the right leg, one to the left leg, and one to the back. I remember lying on the ground thinking, this is it. This is it. I blacked out. I woke up three months later in a hospital. My decision making skills closely resembled that of a squirrel crossing the street at the time. This is what I get getting shot 21 times. Aww. I had a machine breathing for me. I had a machine feeding me. I had a machine pumping my blood. It's a miracle with 21 bullets ripping through me that I'm still here today. It's a miracle. I just want to point out in this picture that at no time was it my decision to have a Magnum P.I. mustache. The nurses did that to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that was not a good decision. So, somehow, some way, I survived. I was in the hospital for, for nine months total, three in a coma, three in recovery, and, and three in, in uh, Rehabilitation. I was 220 pounds when I got shot when I got out of the hospital. You can kind of see in this picture, I weighed 130 pounds soaking wet. Wow. This is the first time that I, um, that I had sat and spent any kind of time with my kids in over two years. My oldest son was so angry at me. You see the next couple pictures, he's never looking at me, he's never smiling, and he has a great view at My little guy was a little bit more forgiving. He was just happy that dad was around here. But I can tell you that just because I got shot 21 times, that is not a get out of jail free card. I was sentenced to two years in the federal penitentiary. And for the next two years, that's, I saw my kid one time. This is the one time that I saw him when, when he came down to Southern California to, to visit me. This is my mother coming to visit me. After years of drug use, a year in the hospital, this is the only time I got to see my parent was behind bars. I can tell you what switch, the switch that, that changed my life. I'm not a, a, a very religious man. I consider myself spiritual. I consider myself a very spiritual man. I don't know what's out there. I don't try to put a name on it. But my sister and me, we've always been the closest. And this is something that I, I, I really don't share with too many people, but I think that, uh, that I'd like to share with you today. This is what changed uh, my entire life. My sister sends me a letter, and she just says, you were meant for something great. 
I love you. That's all the lips. And then there's this card in there. In the letters. It's Jesus sitting on a bench with the rough looking kid who this is lost and found. It was the first time in my life, in years, in years, that I didn't feel alone. That somebody still believed that I was meant for something greater than what I was doing. And from that moment on, my life changed. When I walked out of those prison gates, I knew I had to be different. I knew that every decision that I had made from that point on had to be a good decision. That I had to start looking for the future. All I knew that when I walked out through those prison gates is that I wanted to be a force to be reckoned with in a positive way for the first time in my life. And so that's what I decided to do. And from that point on, you cannot stop. I've spoken to over 100,000 kids in the Midwest over the last four years. My favorite thing to do. We have to invest in our future. We have to invest in our future, and our future are our kids. It's about giving back. And once again, when you give, it comes back on a foot. 
every time. My life when I wake up in the morning is not about me. It's about what can I do for others. And it's been a blessing for me every single day living my life like that. I get to meet little kids like this who are going to be future paralytics. I'm racing against the fastest people on the, the fastest Paralympic athletes on the planet, as David Prince. And I'm doing these amazing things, and it's all because I changed my decision making. I changed my my thinking paths, the way that I thought, and I'm giving back. I competed in in uh, the Desert Challenge Games, the Endeavor Games, running the one, the two, and the four hundred. I, can, I did my first bodybuilding competition a year and a half ago and took fifth place out of 20 able-bodied athletes. I wanted to do everything. There's so much to life, and I want it all. I want to experience it all. I won seven state records and a, and a world record in powerlifting. It just keeps going. First place in the 100, first place in the 200, second place in powerlifting at the Endeavor Games last year. I was making uh, front page front page news at home. I would like to, uh, all these things that I, I was doing, the, the competing, the bodybuilding, the, the track and field, I caught the attention of some, some uh, American coaches. And I get a call two years ago, this random call in the morning, and it's like, hey, Mr. Willis, this is um, so-and-so. Have you ever thought about trying out for it? Uh, have you ever thought about doing bobsled? What? <laughs> well, I said, no, that's never crossed my mind. I thought he was joking. He said, well, well I'm, I'm an Olympic coach up here in Calgary, and we're putting together the first ever uh, USA boxing, bobsled team for a pair of athletes. Would you like to come try out? I want to do it all. So why not? I go up to Calgary, and I'm, and I'm training uh, for box set for two weeks, and, and during this, uh, during the training, I'm watching these other guys compete, these skeleton athletes, pair athletes, and skeleton is, uh, once again, skeleton is going head first down the ice track at about 80 miles an hour. The coaches decide that I would make a better skeleton athlete, so they keep asking me, you know, hey, would you like to try skeleton on home? There's not a chance you're hitting me on that little sled. <laughs> So I keep training for Boston for a few days. At the end of the two weeks that I was up there, they were having the first World Cup for para athletes for the uh, same sport of skeleton. So they keep asking me, look, just try it, just try it. Three days before the World Cup, they finally talked me, in, um, uh, talked me into getting on one of these sweats. I go down, and the first time I make it down, I don't know if I was just ecstatic because I was still alive, <laughs> or I actually like this sport, but I just get up. I remember getting off, and I was just all smiles. I was like, that was amazing. That's what I want to do. So with three days before the World Cup, I ended up qualifying. I had two of the fastest times on the track that week, and, at the World, and then I got invited to compete in the World Cup at the end of that week because of my times. I ended up taking second place in the first ever World Cup that was held in Calgary. And I took second place, I think, I don't know, once again, I don't know if it was just dumb luck, or, or if this is something that I was really good at, but I would like to show you guys a couple of videos, is that all right? Do we have time, I'm good? So I show you a couple of videos of what uh, it looks like. The first one is a video of what it looks like going down a skeleton track, and the, and the run not going so well, okay? So I wanna show you first. <laughs> Uh, of what it looks like going down and it not looking so good. Can we uh, play that first video?
and I took four from the world. This is uh, my teammates. This is the U uh, Team USA Bob Sled and Skeleton Team. This is taking uh, fourth place in Eagles off season during the World World Cup. This is at the Olympic Park in, uh, in uh, Utah, in Park City, Utah, for the World Championships. I love that shot right there. Taking number three, getting my first podium spot in St. Louis, Switzerland. And then this is uh, on, on the podium, taking number four in the World Championship this year in Park City. But once again, all the medals, all the places that I've seen, amazing, amazing. It's incredible that this is my life now. Once again, coming from, from a thug, drug dealer, got shot 21 times, and could have eaten very easily given up on life. But having that one act of kindness, my sister telling me, you are meant to fucking great. Be that person that when you see somebody having a hard time, be that person that lifts them up. You are meant for something great. Everybody in here is meant for something great. That little dude is my biggest fan. And he's my biggest motivator too. I will never lose focus on the things that really matter in my life again. Never. My family, my wife, my kids, all these medals are great, but without my family behind me, they're really not. Yeah. 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 They're announcing this September the inclusion of Skeleton and Bob Seven to the Winter Paralympics. And I can tell you, I am going to be representing my country in the first ever Paralympic event for Bob Sutton Skeleton. I plan on being a So, I just want to uh, close with a few things. I've said it over and over again throughout this. It's your decision. What you want to do with your life, the kind of person you want to be, the kind of parent, it's your decision. That's all I can do is to make decisions. What kind of decisions are you going to make tomorrow when you wake up? I hope that something that I said today motivates you to be a better person. I hope something that I said today sparks something in you. And you go and you try something you never tried. What do you want to be? Reach for the stars. There's nothing, there's nothing stopping you. Really. This year also, uh, I'm very proud we have started a nonprofit organization called Champions Rebuilt. Now, Champions Rebuilt uh, is just that. What we are trying to do is rebuild champions and, and take this future, this uh, next generation, and give them the opportunity to be something great. Champions Rebuilt, what we want to do is provide uh, equipment for upcoming athletes with special needs. We want to provide equipment uh, or, or travel funds for upcoming athletes, parents, special Olympics. We want to be able to give these kids of next generation the tools and the opportunities that they might not have because of funds. So that's uh, something that I'm very, very proud of. Uh, Champions we built will be selling afterwards uh, t-shirts. Uh, with every t-shirt that you buy, uh, we have some really cool pictures um, uh, that we have that I've brought that I'll, that I'll be signing. With every purchase, you get a, a signed autographed picture and a bracelet. Uh, all those funds go to help a kid in need, a kid who wants to be something greater. We're going to rebuild champions in this country. And I'm going to do it one kid at a time. If that's how I have to do it, but I'm not going to stop until, until this thing is blowing up. So today, uh, I talked to my wife, and uh, this is a brand new uh, nonprofit organization. So we've just been so busy building it. I wanted this event to be the first time 
and we actually give back to somebody. So I got a question for you guys in the audience today. Uh, what kids in here want to play sports? I, I want to see some hands up. What, I'm going to come, is it okay if I come down here and stop? Do we have, do we have a microphone? What, what sport do you want to play? You want to play soccer? You want to do competitive? What, what sport do you want to play? Football? Football? We got a couple football players down here. Oh, thank you. All right. I come with my boys. Yeah, two boys? What do they do? Only guy with girls competing in, in gymnastics. No, I, 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 I'm Pat, and then her other kids are in paddleboard. She's in coach. Give it up for this amazing lady. Yeah. Well, what do you want to do? Um, baseball. Baseball? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to ask a few more kids what sports that they like to play here. How about you? What do you, what do you like to do? Basketball. All right. Do you, do you play on a team? Do you play on a team? How about you? What do you, what do you like to do? Bowling. Bowling. All right. So I'm going to ask a couple, a couple more kids. What, what do you like to do? Hockey. Hockey. All right. We have a pool. Tell me. Why do you want to mess with you? Hockey player. All right, how about you, buddy? Basketball is my sport, Basketball. And this is, this is awesome. Basketball. Still the hockey, man. That's cool. How about you, buddy? Cross country and track. So I got another question. You know, we, we, I met so many amazing kids. This is my proud moment. I met so many amazing kids this weekend that, that touched me personally. But I want to hear from a couple of the parents. Is there a kid in here that touched you? That really, when you met him, really touched your heart? Parents? Yeah? You met a kid this weekend? Couple of them? You remember their names? Gabriel and Ezekiel, are they in the house right now? Gabriel and Ezekiel? No? Yeah, yeah, so he just asked if, um, if I had problems with my, my old son still because, you know, he was angry. And, and uh, yes, I have full custody of both my kids and they both live with me now. And, uh, we Woo! Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm speaking of the two nights. Can you really hear me now? <laughs> so, uh, parents, like, I, I really want to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. Mallory C. Chris. Of a young man with cerebral palsy, and we've been friends with for many years, saved the life of a young girl who almost drowned in the pool here last night. Is she here today? <laughs> well, what was her name? Mallory. Is Mallory here today? She's at the pool. She's at the pool saving lives still. So, uh, any more parents? Say, right here. Yeah. My son. Is, is this him right here? Joshua? Oh, bowling. <laughs> you like bowling? You like bowling too? Okay, so, you know, I was going to pick, I was actually going to have a parent pick a recipient of the grant that I'm going to give today, um, but I think I just, I want to split it up into a few people, like I really feel like we need to give to, to multiple people and spread it out a little bit, are you guys okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. So before, before, before I leave today, so there was there some kids back here? We're going to get you back here, Father. Let me ask a few more kids back here. What do you like to do, dude? Shotgun. You, you 
you like to play soccer? Do you like to go, do you travel when you, when you compete? Yeah? They got gold. Give them a hand. Uh, 